Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my talk today um, on changes in perennial vegetation extent and vigour. My name is Catherine Smooch, and I'm the program leader of Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis at the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, and I'm also the chair of the Land Monitor Project, which is a consortium of government departments working together to produce imagery products for the West state of Western Australia. Today I'm recording this presentation from the lands of the Wujak Noongar people and I understand that you are today meeting on Minang Noongar country. I respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional custodians on this land on which we are meeting. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit about the Land Monitor Project. What is it? Who are we? What do we do? And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about satellite data. So hopefully to help you understand what it is and how it can help understand what's happening on the land. And then we'll have a look at some of the vegetation cover changes that have happened around Albany. So explore some of the data products that come out of Land Monitor. And I'll also quickly show you some other sources of information. So you can see that there's a lot of information out there and we, need, and we can use that to under, help understand what's happening. So the Land Monitor Project is a collaboration across government um, for many government, state government agencies, so you'll see them listed here, plus CSIRO, Landgate and Water Corporation. And we come together to deliver imagery based information. It's been around for 25 years, initially developing products to address salinity questions and then building on that knowledge to deliver vegetation products across the southwest of WA. In 2018, we expanded to the whole of the state to produce the imagery and vegetation monitoring products. And we continue to develop these products and make them fit for purpose and use. I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that Land Monitor doesn't do this alone. Uh, we also have partners that help us deliver and undertake the work we do. So that's the Palsy Supercooling Centre, the Federal Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water and Geoscience Australia. Especially you'd like to put a shout out to the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. They are one of the main partners that help us get to this statewide level of production of uh, vegetation and imagery products. So here's a bit of back background on imagery and imagery processing. So here we've got an image of the Perth metropolitan area and it looks like how we might see it with our own eyes in what we call the red, green and blue parts of the light spectrum. And a bit like taking a picture with your digital camera, it records numbers on pixels. So those pixels represent how strong the light was in that particular colour back Back to, the, back to the camera and then we can use those numbers to do analysis, maths and stats with these values. So what I'm showing you here is that when you have a pixel from a satellite that's 24,000 kilometres up in space, that you might have a bigger pixel than you do with your camera on the ground. So this 30 metres by 30 metres here uh, represents a pixel from a satellite called Landsat and when it records a pixel, it covers that sort of area, um, like a quarter acre block, and you get the numbers back from that. So with consistent processing, we can compare those values across vast areas. So we need to do some sort of processing to make sure that uh, the same type of tree here and the same type of tree here look the same. And these sensors on the satellite, so the cameras are built with sensitive sensors that provide more information bands. So what I'm referring there to there is that you can see beyond what the humans can see. So humans see in what we call the red, green, blue parts of the spectrum, but I've made an image here where you can see, you're seeing the near infrared parts of the spectrum shown in green. So those are those areas of really bright green, uh, irrigated 
grasslands. So we've got the golf courses and the ovals are really bright green and then we can see that the forest area is a green but not quite as bright. And you can see the vegetation along uh, rivers will be brighter too. So that tells us some information that wasn't available in the other parts of the light spectrum that we normally see. And the great thing is that we get multiple days of this. So we get repeat observations of the same bit of the earth many times a year. So that's awesome. We can make a really great stack of information through time, which is a bit overwhelming really, because there's a lot of information there that we can we can examine. So we've got in Land Monitor, we've got information from 1998 to, to 2022, annual processed imagery with many consistent observations. So how can we look at that information? There's several different ways we can interrogate it. We could look at a site, so we can get down to a single pixel and have a look through time what's happening. So this is an example of following a pixel through time for its vegetation cover. So it's been pretty stable through time, something's happening here and then there's been a large change and then we see a recovery. We can also summarise those changes over large areas. So for a national park, for example, we might want to understand what areas have stayed the same, been relatively stable in their vegetation cover, which ones have been gaining vegetation cover, which areas have been losing vegetation cover. So we can assess over a large area what's been happening. And also we can make maps of it, so spatially understand where those changes are happening. Are they happening in blocks of change or are they happily distributed across the whole area? The maps really help us interpret and get the message across about what's been happening on the ground. So those are really, that's really a quick introduction to imagery and some of the processing that we do. Now we're going to go have a look at, specifically in Albany, what products are in Land Monitor that we can have a look at. So I thought I'd just choose this area south of the southeast of the Stirlings. Um, what we're seeing here is the Land Monitor web page. And so you can go to this web page now and have a look at this data. And I've chosen the year 2020, which has fallen off the edge here. But just to have a look around this image, you can see this image was taken at the beginning of 2020. All these images are taken in midsummer of the year that they're indicated on. There's been a recent fire, large fire in the Stirlings here, and we can see the effects of a fire earlier on. We can also see lots of green plantation data down here, and we can see some sand dunes on the coast. The cropping areas look really bare because most of the crops have come in at this stage. So if we zoom in, we get a better feel for the detail that's available in this type of imagery. So we can see if we've gone to the paddock scale, alley farming in this paddock. Um, we can see the detail in the wetlands um, and some of the fence line vegetation. It's, that's really at the limit of our ability to detect small patches of vegetation. So if we zoom out again and have a look at this 2020 image, we can see the whole area again. And we can also see we have every year going back to 1988 available. So if we have a look at a 1988 image, you can see it's quite different. It's a different fire impacts. We can also see there's a lot of changes happened in this southern region. A lot more plantations around the Poronga up here that are not, weren't there in 1988 and down in this region too. So that's really interesting. We can see those changes with our eyes. But if we want to quantify and understand those changes a bit better, we need to classify the imagery and make it into a map. So here we can see uh, the 1998 image has been classified into woody vegetation, which is this dark green, and this light beige green colour is more sparse woody vegetation so it's below 20% cover and the green stuff is above 20% cover. So we, now we can get some areas on what's what's in this location and we can do the same to 2020. 
and you can see we've got classified a lot more of this area as woody vegetation around here and what's of interest to DBCA is in how the vegetation cover has changed in the Stirling Ranger National Park due to fires and other impacts. So that's telling us already a lot of information about what was there in 1988 and what's there in 2020. But how are we going to look through time and understand the contribution of all the years of imagery we've got to uh, to understand where changes have been happening on the ground? Uh, one way of doing that is to use uh, trend analysis. So here we've got a vegetation trend image from the time period 2010 to 2020. And what we're showing on here is a riot of colour, which all represents different directions of vegetation cover change. So the reds are vegetation declines in cover in that time period, so that generally means something happened towards the end of that 2010 to 2020 time period. So you'll see that more recent fires in there. And you'll also see in blue some recovery of fires that probably occurred in the beginning of that time period. And then a lot of different colours in the plantations as depending on when they've been cleared or wherever they're growing. And then you'll see colours like the yellow indicates uh, loss and recovery, some recovery, but not back to previous. Green indicates loss and recovery back to previous. So you get start to get an idea on the map where things have been changing. So that image, that riot of colours is really useful for like a visual inspection, but if we want to calculate what areas have been changing, losing cover, what areas have been gaining cover, what areas have been staying stable, we need to classify that trend into classes. And that's how we get to this image here. So here we've got yellows mostly stable, and then we have the reds where it's been losing cover, and blues where it's been gaining cover. So that's, that's going to give us the ability to calculate over time, over that area, what has been changing in that time period. That's great, but we don't really know necessarily why things have changed. So this is where other data set sources come into their own. Plantation data is one of those data sets. We know there probably is plantations in that location, so let's see what's available out there. So there's a couple of places we can get plantation data, and this plantations, Australian Plantations 2016, it's a little bit old, but we'll have a look and see how that overlays on our area. So if we have a look, we can see that actually it outlines a lot of the areas of plantation that were pretty obvious from the imagery. So now we know we can be pretty confident that these changes within these lines are due to plantation rotation. However, there's some areas like here and over here which do not have any lines around them. So let's be curious. So let's have a closer look. So if we zoom into that area, we can see, yep, definitely been some change here. We can see that our plantation mapping covers some of those changes for that time period. So here we're looking at 2011 to 2021 change. Let's just go back to the beginning and see what's, what was mapped as been, um, woody vegetation back then. So we can see our Plantation polygons don't really cover anything in that year, and there wasn't seemed to be any plantation in that location. We look in 2020, we can see that our plantation polygons cover some of the areas, and still nothing in the middle. So let's go back to 2011, because we know there must have been something there then. But if we go back to 2011, we can see the shape that was classified as woody vegetation back then. And we can look at the imagery and go, yeah, that definitely looks like the plantation. So it just tells us that we have other data sets out there that can really inform us on what's been happening. But having that annual look of imagery helps us really tie down to when and where things were in the landscape. So the plantation data is 2016. That plantation was already cleared by then, so it, that's probably why it's not in that data set. But if you were looking at climate data from 2011 and you wanted to understand um, overland flows, 
it would be really important to know that that plantation was there at that time period. So I wanted to show you all that data that Landmarch produces, but really it does provide a springboard into a more in-depth time series analysis. And this is what my team does here at DBCA. We, we have these base products that help us then extend our applications into our management of the environment. So here's an example of a graph that was published as part of the forest management plan reporting about areas in the forest where there's been declining vegetation cover. Here's uh, some analysis we did on Dirk Hartog Island to help us understand the changes in the vegetation cover following sheep and goat removal. So this analysis helped us work out where those changes were happening, but also helps us to decide where to introduce new um, native mammals so that they have a habitat to, to start from. And this one is where we've been in Fitzgerald River National Park investigating uh, observed declines in the beaches there. So we, we, so people see things on the ground, then we can go out there, visit them, but also look back in time with the satellite imagery and see what's been happening over that time period. So I wanted to show you some other sources of information that might be of interest. So this is the water observations from space from Digital Earth Australia. So you can uh, go to that on the web and have a look. I've zoomed into the area, the Stirling Range National Park, and we can see some wetlands to the north and to the south here. And what I've done is loan, loaded in the inundation for the year 2017. So you can see there's a legend here that tells us about if it's black and red, um, it's hardly ever inundated. And if it's purple and blue, it's mostly always inundated. So these wetlands here, over here, and here in 2017 were mostly inundated. And then if we move forward through time, we can look at 2018, we can see a little bit less inundation in the wetlands. 2019, that trend is continuing. We're getting less inundation in these wetlands here and here. 2020, it's continued to be less inundated than it was in 2017 or even perhaps in previous years. And then 2021, we're seeing a lot more inundations. So some of these wetlands here are starting to be more inundated like they were previously, but not quite to the same level as in 2017. So possibly I'm telling you things that you already know about what's been happening with the water levels in the area over the years, but this data is out there so that we can quantitatively know how much it's changed and when it changed. So it really helps us undertake analysis. So it's great resources out there for you guys. So I'm sure some of you now are excited to go and get your hands dirty and have a look at some of this data. You can get this data at our current website you can inspect it on this web the website I was showing you earlier and here's a snapshot of it here before the land monitor website soon the data will be available on locate which is run by landgate so this is an example of the view of landgate it's like locate viewer and you can see here you can load heaps of different data sets that are available on the uh, on, that, on their portal, so you can then look at the land monitor data with other data sets, which is really useful. And the service, soon there will be services available which will make this data more easy to use through, through SLIP. So I've got the website here, data.wa.gov.au. Keep an eye on that, um, and the data will be available soon. So to recap, there's an entire landscape of detailed vegetation mapping and vegetation change information going back 35 years. And there's many other sources of information available out there too, on inundation, plantation, fire. Um, I'm sure you'll hear about lots of other data that's out there during the forum. The Land Monitor Project aims to continue to use satellite and other imagery data to help form a system and decision making in WA. So we hope to produce these products into the future. Now we're making you aware of these project, these products. If you know they're there, you know to ask about them, but also the, ask for the expertise to deliver 
this data in a way and this information that's regionally relevant for what you need to apply it for. So for example, DBCA, we work in our team, Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis, we work across the department with the land managers to understand what's happening on the ground and what we need to do to analyse the data to make it relevant to their use. So if they're putting in a fence or they're trying to manage DIPAC, we're trying to provide all the spatial information or their satellite imagery analysis to help them make informed decisions and measure what they're doing. So understanding where things are happening, when they're happening and how they're happening needs all those things together. So we can we can go a long way with imagery and spatial analysis, but really that understanding on the ground is really important too. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the forum and it all goes well and I wish I was there with you. Have a great day. Bye. Here's a large chunk of the south coast, and most of you will be familiar with the shape of the Stirling Ranges, the Pronger Ups, Albany, Denmark is here, Walpole is here, Lake Muir. Um, so here's the time series. I'm going to show you a slideshow, so just uh, bear with me. <laughs> this area is quite a large portion, but of a uh, map sheet known as SI50, which is uh, starts in Fremantle and goes as far as Ravensthorpe. Um, and it's kind of a time machine. So in this image, we're looking 43 years ago. The green color is woody vegetation. The red color was cleared during this three year period. The green is some kind of recovery of vegetation or regrowth. And the blue is former regrowth from the series which has been stored and accumulated. So we can actually see what's happened to land vegetation, woody vegetation extent, uh, using the time series. We can go the next five years, 80 to 85, clearing was very active in the region. You can see, and there's also some fires removing vegetation in the Stirlings. Um, as we go through the 80s, the clearing is, all, is much less. Um, and by the end of the 80s, the clearing for agriculture is almost stopped. I believe the legislation came in about then, so that showed policy impact. Um, if we get into the early 90s, we're seeing in blue sort of accumulating forest recovery, some re recovery from fire. And in the mid 90s, you start to see the plantation roll out of blue gum plantations. So light green is new plantations in that period. And as we go through, we can see how the blue gum cover has altered that landscape. And we get into the mid 2000s and some of the blue gums are harvested. If it's yellow, it's not replanted. Uh, and the red is the current reharvest. So this is now an annual time steps. And it's really a demonstration, I'll stop there by the way, uh, of the capacity to monitor change in extent of woody vegetation. Now, of course, people who are alert will realize most of that is blue gums, it's not strictly native vegetation. Uh, and some of the impacts, of course, are not clearing, but they're fire. So really you need some other knowledge or other information to attribute these processes. But the fundamental monitoring information is fully available at 25 meters for this area. And that's part of a larger area. In fact, it's available in this form. It's up to date for the entire country.